Okay, hello everybody. So it's the second day of CLA and we are happy to listen to Martin Pepper about statistical analysis of non-deterministic for joint processes. So thank you, good morning or good afternoon, whenever you are. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Martin Pepin, as you said. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Sorbonne University in Paris. I work with Antoine Genitrini and Frédéric Pichansky, which you may know, I guess. And today I'm going to talk about uh, concurrency and, as you said, statistical analysis of non-deterministic for joint processes. So before I, I go into that, I'd like to give you some, it's not working. Yes. some uh, insights about concurrency. Okay, sorry for that. So concurrency is a programming paradigm in which you have uh, uh, several processes and they may do uh, they may compute stuff independently they may communicate they may fork new processes they may wait for other processes to stop before doing something else but in the end they are all going to be uh, sharing one uh, computation unit so think one cpu so that sorry I, i'm having trouble with my computer uh, so yeah, so that in the end, you will have a scheduler that uh, takes the smallest component of your programs, that takes the, the atomic actions, we say, and that put them in a linear order on the computation unit, such that this order uh, uh, is uh, correct with respect to the logic of the program, but there may be a lot of uh, different valid, valid ordering. So that's scheduling, and that's what concurrency is about, studying these kind of processes. And so uh, in this setup, when you want to check that the program is correct, then you have to check that all the possible schedulings are correct, right? And that, uh, the fact of considering all possible schedulings, uh, that's typically a combinatorial problem. So, uh, and what happens in reality is that there are in fact a huge, there are typically a huge number of possible schedulings and we call that a combinatorial explosion or people in concurrency prefer to call it state explosion, but it's the same thing. So that in general, this is uh, impractical to test all the possible uh, scheduling and people have to resort to other tricks to uh, verify that, their programs. And so what can we do to help them? Well, we can look at two different problems. First, we can try to quantify this explosion. So that's a counting problem. We take a program and we would like to measure the size of its state space of the, we would like to count the number of possible schedulings. And also we can sample executions among uh, all the possible executions. And that's helpful because that's actually what people do for, uh, I mean, not everyone, but that, that's what some people do to check that the program are correct. They take a sample of possible schedulings and they check these uh, particular schedulings. And we can help by providing efficient and uniform uh, samplers, which, which is important because uh, uniformity means a good coverage. And okay, so, Martin, what do you call a correct uh, schedule? What do you call a correct uh, schedule? Uh, that's, that's not the topic of the, uh, of the talk here. Um, I assume that you have some notion of correctness, okay? Maybe you just want to run some tests, check that some invariant as are, are verified. You have your notion of correctness and you need to have a scheduling to test this uh, property on your program. And what I give you is, what I'm gonna give you is uh, a sample of possible schedulings. And you're gonna check that uh, all these scheduling satisfy your, your property. And if that's the case, then you're happy and you're confident that uh, your program is correct. So, I'm providing the tool for people to verify the program. I don't specify what verifying means. That's okay. That's, does it answer your question? So I'm gonna keep going, right? So the first issue we face when we want to uh, do this is this result from Brightwell and Winkler, which states that the number of uh, linear extensions of a partial order is, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, I mean, counting them is a sharply complete problem. So first, um, uh, a partial order, it's, it's really like a, a, a concurrent program. When you have a concurrent program, you have a, bu a bunch of actions and constraints uh, between them. Uh, you, you say that 
Action A must be run before action B. So this is typically a partial order. And counting linear extensions corresponds exactly to counting uh, schedulings. So we are talking about the same thing. And short P complete means that it's as difficult as counting the number of, uh, of solution in SATs. So it's strictly more difficult that than uh, checking that a SAT instance is satisfiable. So it's more difficult than uh, an NP-complete problem. So we are definitely not going to try to solve this. So we can't do the general case. This is what this means. But fortunately for us, in real life, program have some kind of structures in, in general. So they're written by humans who, who think in a structured way. So we are going to enforce some some uh, uh, sorry, some constraints on the program, some structure, and look what we can do from there. And that is exactly what these people have been doing for the past few years. So the idea is to st study the quantitative aspects, uh, quantitative and algorithmic aspects of concurrent programs. And the idea is to take some core components of concurrency, which uh, I will describe in a moment, the essential features and look at programs that only have these features and no more. And using some combinatorial interpretation of these features, we can extract some results using the two set of combinatorics. Okay, so that's the big picture, and that's where my PhD fits in. So the talk will be divided in two sections. First, I will introduce a class of concurrent programs that has um, the most basic features you, you would like to have in your programs, I guess. In the second section, I will talk to you about the algorithmic aspects, uh, algorithmic solution to the two prog problems I mentioned before. I mentioned before. So, I told you about essential features of concurrency. Well, the most essential one is these. Uh, can you see my pointer? Can I move it? Or yes, thanks. Yes. Uh, so the most important one is this parallel composition operator. So when I say I, I have two programs, P and Q, and I compose them in parallel, I mean that they will run independently. So an execution or a scheduling of, well, I'm using the two words, but I mean the same thing. A scheduling of P parallel Q, that can be any interleaving of a scheduling of P and a scheduling of Q. Okay, so that's what this means. They run independently, anything can happen. On the other hand, you may want to uh, have some kind of synchronization and you may want to say, I run a program P, I wait, I wait for it to terminate, and then I will run a program Q. And this is sequential composition. So naturally, an execution of P sequence Q is, the, is an execution of P followed by an execution of Q. And if you have only these two constructions, you end up with something we called a fork join, four join type of parallelism. This is typically what you have if you're using a Unix, uh, no, sorry, yes, POSIX threads, I think, without loops and, and anything like that. So this is the, maybe the core of the core of the, of the program. But that's not enough to write interesting programs, so I'm going to introduce two other operators. First, uh, the choice operator that models the branching that may happen at runtime. So think of an if. If some condition run P, Otherwise, run Q, and you can't guess the condition uh, before running the program. So this is why we call this a non-deterministic choice. And naturally, an execution of P choice Q is either an execution of P or an execution of Q. So uh, that's not too difficult. And uh, another useful construction is the loop. So we are gonna we chose a well-behaved uh, form of loop which we denote, we denote a Q star. And I say that an execution of Q star is any sequence of executions of Q. So it may do nothing, or it may run Q once or twice or three times, etc. cetera. And, and, and that's pretty much it. I mean, if I summarize, I, my, my four uh, combinators are here. I also add uh, two base cases. So I will have atomic actions. That's the smallest component of your programs, and they can be split in two. And I, and I will have the empty program, which does nothing. And also, I'm going to assume that across my program, every atomic action is distinct. So 
I'm working on the control flow of programs rather than actually what they are computing. So from my point of view, two different actions are not distinguishable. Sorry, they are distinguishable. So I know that they are different. So I'm, I'm assuming all the actions are, are distinct. OK. So that was for the syntax. And I gave you more or less informally here uh, the semantics of the program. Now I'm going to reform reformulate the semantics in terms of uh, commentorial interpretation. So it's going to be a little more formal. And for each program P, I'm going to describe a combinatorial class, bracket P, a specification that describes all the possible schedulings of, of the program, all the possible ways it can be executed uh, on, a, on a computation unit. So in the base case is this is easy. Uh, an empty program does nothing. So it has only one possible ways of executing and it has size zero because it does nothing. So that's modeled by the epsilon class. On the other hand, an atomic action, uh, it does one thing. It can do only one thing. So it has an also one execution, but of length one because it does one atomic action. So I'm counting atomic action here. Okay. The next constructors are more interesting. So in the case of P sequence Q, as I told you, an execution of P sequence Q is an execution of P followed by an execution of Q. So any pair is possible and this is this is exactly what a, a Cartesian product is. Okay, so if I want to count them, I'm going to count a, a Cartesian product. On the other hand, for the parallel composition, I also have to take account of the, the interleaving. So the trick here is to use the, the labeled product from labeled uh, combinatorial classes. So this, this means take a scheduling of, of P, take a scheduling of Q, of Q and uh, choose an interleaving. And at this point, I'd like to point out that um, it's, it's rather unusual to have these two operators uh, in the same grammar, because this belongs to the unlabeled world, world uh, of combinatorics, and this belongs more to the labeled world. You can make them work in the same specification, but that's, that's unusual, I guess. Okay, I'm, I'm, I keep going with the, my two last constructions. So I had the choice. So in a program P choice Q, uh, an execution is either an execution of P or an execution of Q. So if I, if I have to count them, I'm gonna use the disjunct union here. And in the case of the loop, as I told you, an execution of P star is a sequence of executions of P. So I know this using the sequence construction. So at that point I'm done, but I've made a mistake. Can you, can you spot it? The thing is that uh, uh, um, the set of executions of a program can contain the empty execution. And in that case, I have two issues. Here, my union is not disjoint because it's almost disjoint, but the empty execution can belong to, the, to both specs. And also this sequence is, uh, is not well defined because I can have an object of type zero here. So that's fixable. The trick is to consider the non-empty executions of P plus Q. So this is a well-defined uh, disjunct union. And also I can say that an execution of P star of loop of P is a sequence of non-empty executions. I just remove the empty executions from the process. Okay, so that was a, a little trick, a, a little trap. But now I'm done and I have specified in an automatic way the executions of the program. And I'm happy because now that I have this combinatorial specification, I can use a lot of tools from combinatorics. And that's going to help me solve uh, my two questions that I had before, that is counting the number of executions of a program and sampling among them. So I'm going to jump to the next part of my talk. And the first algorithm I would like to present is uh, the, algorithm, the algorithm for counting executions. So I have a program. And you would like to know the number of uh, executions of length n, so with n atomic actions inside. Okay. I already described you this transformation from program to its uh, specification, and I I have in my tool set the symbolic method that helps me jump from the spec to a gener generating function, and then from there 
I can extract the number of executions by extracting a coefficient. So all, all of this works well. And I think all of you know what the symbolic method is. For the sake of completeness, I recalled, I, I expressed explicitly the, the translation from program to generating function here. Uh, so that's uh, natural. There are a few things to be mentioned here. Uh, first of all, I would like to implement this on, a, on my computer, which is finite. So I'm gonna, not going to work with generating function, but rather than truncated uh, generating function. So I stop at degree n. Uh, also note the, the subtractions here. They are here to handle the, the little uh, trap we had before. Remember that this uh, union is not disjoint and stuff like that. And also, we may have noticed this construction here, which is a little bit odd. We call this the color product, and uh, it's the expression in terms of ordinary generating function of the label product. Because remember, we have these, uh, we have at the same time uh, uh, enabled constructions and label constructions. So I have to choose between ordinary generating function and exponential generating function. I chose ordinary. So now I have to express the label product in terms of uh, ordinary generating function. And actually, it's not that hard. The trick is to do a conversion. So first thing, you convert the P and Q generating function into exponential ones. That's the purpose of the Borel transform. OK, you, that you can do in linear time on your computer. Then you do your product, a normal product. And you go back to the, the unlabeled world with the Laplace transform, which is the converse of the Borel transform, and which also can be implemented in linear time. So that's not very difficult, but uh, again, this is uh, unusual. And I claim that this algorithm performs in p times mn uh, multiplication, where p is the size of the program, and mn is the cost of one polynomial multiplication, where the polynomial has degree n. And the reason uh, behind this is that at each, for each constructor in my program, I do only one operation. Uh, a theta of one operation. Here I do one multiplication plus some linear transformation that are cheap. Then I do just one multiplication. Here I do an addition, which is cheap. And this inversion here uh, can, in fact, be implemented in at the cost of one multiplication. The trick is to use a Newton iteration, if you know about this. If not, take a look at, at the paper from uh, Pivoto, Salvi, and Soria, which is great and explains it at length. But basically, the bottom line is you can implement this at the cost of one uh, multiplication, in an amortized cost of one multiplication. So in the end, I have this complexity. And also, I'm multiplying big integers, which have about n log n bits, because of the interleaving, which bring uh, binomial coefficients and factorial and stuff like that. So the, the bit complexity in the end is, is like that. For each construction, constructor in the program, I do uh, one multiplication over integers of n log n bits. So this is a, a polynomial of degree a little more than two in n. Okay, so that's for the counting problem. And I'm, I'm going to jump to random sampling. So not a little bit more involved. So again, I'm going to use my specification, and I want to go to a uniform execution of given length of my program. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to use a well-known technique from Cominatorix. This time this is called the recursive method. Uh, that's been described by Flegelet, Timmerman, and Van Kempten. Um, but this time, rather than uh, showing you the algorithm, I'm going to explain it on uh, one example. I think it's more easy to understand this way. So I'm going to take a look at this program, this small program, and I want to sample a uniform execution of length three. So here I'm going to write what rule of the recursive method I'm using, and below I have a scratch pad. So first thing, I have this uh, uh, parallel composition here. It turns out that the formula for computing the, the number of executions of this guy is given by this. So this is what you obtain because of the Borel and Laplace transform. So basically, it's like a Cartesian product, but you have the binomial coefficient that take account of the schedule of the interleaving of executions. 
And if I want to take a uniform execution of this uh, composition here, I need uh, an execution of length k of this program, an execution of length n minus k of this other program, and uh, the, the shuffling, the, scale, the interleaving. But how do I choose k? Well, I must choose it according to this distribution in order to remain uh, uniform. And this is because of this formula. So I take one term and I divide it by the n. So let's apply it in this program. Uh, first, I note that k equals to zero is not possible because this program has no length three execution. Similarly, uh, k equals to three is not possible either because again, this program has no execution of length uh, zero. But I must choose between k equals to one and k equals to two. Um, okay, in that case, k equals to one implies that I must choose a, a length one execution here. There are two of them, hence the two here. And there are two executions of length two on the right, so hence the two. And this binary coefficient accounts for the interleaving of one execution with uh, two executions. Uh, k equals to two is similar. I have four executions on the left. I have uh, one, length, one execution on the right plus the interleaving. So in the end, if I compute this sum, I get that I must choose k equals to one with probability one half and k equals to two with probability one half two. So say I choose k equals to one. So now I have to sample a length one execution on the left and a length two execution on the right. Okay, let's focus on the left first. So I have a loop. The thing is with the loop that it behaves like this. P star from the point of view of sampling, P star is the same as zero plus P uh, sequence P star. So I can rewrite my program. And also, also I can remove the zero because I, I'm looking for a non-empty execution here. So it's not possible to go on the left. And now I have a, a, a sequence composition. So again, there is a rule in the recursive method to handle the sequence. So this is more common. This is a Cartesian product. So I must choose the size k on, of the left component according to this distribution. This is the same as before, but I have no binary coefficient this time. And here I observe that the only possibility k equals to one because there is no length zero execution here. Okay. So I must choose an execution of length one here and an execution of length zero here. And since there is only one execution of, of length zero, I can just remove this term. So I'm left with this. And finally, I'm going to show you the rule for the, the distant union, which is the simplest of all. Um, you compute the number of possible length one execution on the left, there is only one. You also compute the number of length uh, one execution on the right, there is also one, so I toss a coin and say I choose A. And now I'm done. That's the base state, that, that's the atom, I, I must choose the atom. So now if I go back up, I still have to handle the right term, I'm not going to bother you with that. Uh, I have a choice, uh, then I will have the sequence and that's that's easy because there is only one choice here, and I end up with this. And in the end, I still have to do my shuffling, my interleaving, and there are three possibilities here that's counted in, in that term, and say I choose this one and I'm done. So that's, that's the, the, the random sampling procedure, and you will notice that here I chose uh, these uh, this term here when I did my uh, random sampling of, of the variable k. So I choose this term and this term here, and I had to sample one uh, permutation. So if you compute one over two times one over two times one over this binomial coefficient, you will find one over 24. And this is exactly the number of length three executions in my, in my program. So I, I indeed have achieved uniformity. Well, on that example, uh, what time do I have left? Uh, okay, that should be fine. So I didn't tell you precisely how to compute these k variables. Um, there is one natural way of doing this. That's to sample a uniform integer between zero and the sum of all the possibilities. And then you compute the partial sum and you stop as soon as you get to x, as you are above x. and the, the term you are at at this moment, uh, that's the k you should pick. Okay, and that, that's a way to sample a k with this distribution. 
turned out that there is a better way that had been found by Flagellet, Simmerven, and Frankensen, and studied in depth by Molinero. That's called the Bustrovetonic algorithm. And the idea is rather than summing these terms, uh, uh, rather than taking the partial sum in that order, you go, uh, you take the, the first term, then the last, then the second term, then the term before the last term, etc. So you, you sum a bit like this. And by doing so, uh, I, I don't think I have enough time to explain it, but it turns out that your algorithm is going to get faster than if you do uh, this solution. But the reason, in one sentence, the reason is that the, the worst case here is when you take k to be equals to n over 2 and gives you some kind of uh, divide and conquer scheme. You can then your recursive calls, you have n over 2 as arguments and it, it converge faster. So I'm going to use two results there. Uh, first result is that using the Bustrophedonic algorithm, I can achieve uh, n log n complexity for my random sampling procedure. And Molinero also have uh, another result that states that on the recursion free case, uh, you can achieve linearity. And, and that's our case, because remember our specifications, uh, they, they don't have, um, they, are not, they are recursion free. I, I don't refer to the specification to P when I specify P. So in theory, I could use re this result, but actually there is, there is a, a, a trap here because the constant hidden in, in front of this n, uh, it depends on the size of the gamma. So I, I must handle that carefully and you must refine this result. And it turns out that the constant is proportional to the depth of the gamma. So that's equivalent to say it's, it's, it's proportional to the, the height of my program. If you think of my, of my program as, uh, if you think of it as a tree, as a syntactic tree, then the height, the height of this tree, the depth, the number of nested constructors, uh, that's your parameter here. So I can put these two results together and I get this complexity for my random sampling procedure. So it's rather fast. It's much cheaper than uh, counting uh, the number of execution. Of course, I need to have done the counting before, but then it's cheap. And I'm reaching the end of my time, so that's, that's good because I'm done. So I think that if, if I manage to get you, keep you with me all the time, I think that the getaway of this, the takeaway of this talk is that uh, specifications can be used as, as first-class objects. What I mean by that is that we usually, uh, when you look at when we look at a problem, we should, we should usually choose. Uh, I mean, uh, fix a specification. And then we work from there. And in this case, what we have to do is derive automatic, in a systematic way, derive one specification for one instance of the problem and then work from there. And I, th I think it's not used a lot, this kind of techniques, and it can be really useful. So I'd like to, I wanted to highlight that. And from there, there are still a lot of work to do. Well, first, we could generalize the model because, as I mentioned, there is the, the most general problem, which is intractable, and there is this one, which we proved to be tractable, and there are plenty of things in, in between. I would be interesting to investigate that. Also, I didn't talk about any analytic properties of my problem, so that's also something that could be investigated. And finally, the whole purpose of this um, work is to uh, check is to test programs and to answer to Sege's question, actually. So uh, yeah, a, a nice next step would be to, to actually use these techniques to do something like uh, random testing or uh, something called statistical model checking or whatever uh, application we can, we, can, we can have. So I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I think we have five minutes. And I don't know if you can unmute yourself or maybe you just don't have questions. I would have a question if I may. Yeah. So um, I would ask, how far can you go actually with the with the target size? 
of those of those schedules you're generating? Um, pairing the recursive method and, and say Boltzmann set. Yeah, uh, I think we reached something like I should have prepared this question. I should have anticipated it. Let me check. We went until just roughly speaking. You know, yes, I don't, need, I don't need the exact figure. Something like ten thousands, something like that. Ten thousands of uh, atomic actions. Oh, that's quite a lot. Yeah, that, that's that's okay. Let me just confirm. Oh no, I. Sorry, sorry, I've been lying. That's more like uh, five thousands. Sorry. Yeah, five thousands within a a minute. In a minute, in about a minute, you can a little more than a minute, you can compute the number of executions for uh, uh, a program with five thousand nodes and about five thousand uh, executions. Uh, sorry, execution of size about five thousand, three to five thousand. So that's the order of, the, of a minute. And then if you want to do sampling, that's, that's quite fast. It, it's, it, it, it measures in milliseconds, the sampling part. But the, the, really the, the expensive part is counting. Oh yeah, another, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, an extension to, could be to apply something called uh, approximate sampling. Uh, I, I don't remember who did this, but if you count using floating points, arithmetic and if you carefully handle um, your overflow to, if you carefully quantify, sorry, the, the approximation error, maybe you can achieve uh, more efficient uh, sampling, oh, sorry, more efficient counting at the cost of some approximations and then go a little bit further, but I didn't do that. Okay, thank you very much. I would have a short, maybe naive question, but yeah. I really liked like how you 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 modeled all that stuff and how it nicely fits. But I was wondering if you want that, if you're now looking at applications like how big is a, a use a, a, a program in reality you could you would you would expect to test with something like that or you you would work on or how big would that model be like you, you know it's it, I don't know if it's like it's a bit a naive question but I kind of you know what would you expect. I actually I wouldn't expect programs to be too big. I think mm -hmm. about a thousand executions is, is fine, but I, I didn't really investigate this a lot. I, mm -hmm. I know that people doing exhaustive testing, they look at very, very small programs because of okay. the uh, state explosion. Okay. And the other people who have big programs, they do random testing, but in a very naive way and okay. it's far from being uniform. And I don't know. Okay. Okay, so connecting with the previous question, it's like, okay, with 5,000, you can actually do something. I think, but again, I, I would have to yeah, actually that's, that's try it. Very nice. I very think, nice. I, I'm gonna elaborate on this. I think that the problem would not be the size of the problem, but what are the features? I mean, I don't know if a real life problem can fit in yeah. this model. That's yeah, if you can, of course, but that's yeah. that's the model you chose to do, and that's a start, and that's nice, but that's already something. Very nice, thank you. Maybe I have a question about uh, the symbolic and the recursive methods, which are systematic. Yep. Uh, do you use tools to imp to handle them, to help you to uh, no, automate, I, or do you apply it by hand? Well, I implemented all of it, except for the only, sorry, I lost focus, yes. I implemented all of this by hand, I mean, yeah, I implemented all of this in C, so not using Maple or stuff like that. The only tool I used was uh, a library for doing the polynomial multiplications. Because I, I mean, a polynomial multiplication is a whole topic and there are very fine tuned algorithms to do that. So I used the library for that, except for this, all of this is implemented by myself. Oh yeah, and I didn't mention this, but this is available uh, on, Git, on my uh, GitLab profile. I can give a link in the Discord server maybe. Okay, just to inform, the, there is a, a current effort by uh, Florent Yvert to implement the, the tools of combinatorics inside Coq. Yeah. Uh, which is a, a, a proof assistant. Yeah, I, I know about Coq. And he has, a, he has a great experience in it. And uh, so the idea is that you input um, 
the the equations the, um, uh, in terms of uh, combinatorial classes and you get uh, the generating functions and so on the counting and, and so on but uh, it's it's a starting project and he, he works around for the moment so you cannot expect for uh, for a result uh, soon but there, there are already tools in uh, in code oh, sorry the time is over for the talk <laughs> okay is there another question Yes, Julien, you can ask it uh, if you can unmute your microphone. So Julien asks, how likely is it to implement your wired product as a Boltzmann sampler? Well, the problem, that, that's a very interesting question. The problem is on this slide, actually. It's um, everything be, except for, for this line can be implemented, it is easy to implement as a Boltzmann sampler. But since we have this mix of uh, labeled and unlabeled constrictions. That's a really tricky thing to do. And there has been an attempt to do this, actually. Uh, it's, um, I don't, who did this? I think it was Soria and Daras, maybe. Uh, I can find the reference and, and give it to you in the Discord uh, thing. Daras, <clears throat> yes. It's yeah. in the thesis of Daras, Alexi Daras. Okay. So he, they did something. Even if the Exclusion part would be also difficult to have with the Boltzmann sampler. Oh, the, ex the exclusion is not really an issue because you just remove one term in some cases. So you could. But I yeah, could... in Boltzmann sampling, you don't have a particular term that you could remove, I guess. At all. Yeah, but. I mean, for the tuning part. Yeah, but in this particular case, you can rewrite your grammar so that you don't have exclusion. It's just convenient. But since I'm just okay. removing one epsilon sometimes, I can just rewrite the grammar to handle this. So that's feasible. The problem is really in the mix of these two operators, and they tried to implement this. Uh, they tried to do this in the Boltzmann uh, context, but at the cost of an expensive uh, generation procedure. At some point, you have to do something that is similar to uh, the recursive method. So, uh, the, I think it's unlikely to be more efficient than a, a more traditional approach like this. I didn't run their tool because it's. In, I think there is a Maple implementation, but I don't have access to it. But they admit it's not very efficient, so I guess it's difficult. Okay, another question. Oh, I think we can thank again the speaker. <laughs> Um, I can stop the recording for this.